chapter six of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain the students and the luxembourg the visible population of the faubourg st germain besides that described in our last chapter are the medical students and the artists as yet unappreciated and unknown by the world or even still pursuing their studies of the beaux-arts they throng the streets and elbow the honest bourgeois retired from business who take their daily walk to the other side of the seine having ensconced themselves in the by-streets of the aristocratic faubourg on account of the cheapness of the rents l'école de droit and l'école de médecine are on this side of the water together with many of the public schools you may know the student although he be silent quiet and well behaved there is a peculiarity an exaggeration of costume which is unmistakable in undress he is tawdry and slovenly in grande tenue he is dressed as those impossible gentlemen in the prince of the fashions or as a fashionable tailor of the palais royal would dress an american or an englishman who would pay him well and rely only on his taste for the student were invented the rainbow-coloured stuffs in gigantic squares with which he makes his trousers and he wears them in that fashion a compromise between petticoat and pantaloons plaited in around the waist a la cossack it used to be called this hideous fashion is still retained in civilization only by the student his waistcoat is generally much too smart for the daylight being probably the last remains of his ball costume his cravat is loosely tied his coat though threadbare has a sporting cut and his hat what could it be but a cossooth hat these hats have such a rowdy devil-may-care look that a student must long since have imagined it in his dreams and had no time to realize it he has no gloves the ample pockets of the cossack trousers being made to contain hands that rarely do anything else as for his boots they are well blacked and if there is a hole why the stocking beneath is black too and so the hole is hidden these worthies invade the whole of the pavement six or seven abreast arm in arm they smoke cigars for the first week in every month but as the purse gets empty they assume the pipe as a less expensive substitute for the havana the students are the reliance of the revolutionary politicians of paris they are one of the most terrible corps d'armée of a revolution far from their families every department sends her youth to the schools of paris enthusiastic having nothing to lose brave for bravery and a love of fighting is instinctive in a frenchman they may not perhaps care particularly about the principles engaged in the affair but mingle in it from an abstract love for a general row and confusion particularly as such a state of things closes the school indeed how they ever learn anything how they ever take a degree and how it is that the luminaries of most of the learned sciences spring from this country and this class is a perfect mystery aided and abetted as they are in their idleness and love of pleasure by that arch enemy of the gros bonnet professors the pretty tyrant of their homes the world-famed parisian grisette similarity of fortune brings the grisette and the student under the same roof in immeasurably high houses situated in the narrow by-streets of old paris into which the sun can scarcely ever penetrate and from which in many places it is entirely excluded owing to the houses having a friendly inclination to meet at the top no wise satisfactory to those bold enough to look overhead the streets which have no sidewalk but a gutter in the middle are muddy in the midst of summer they are never swept yet never visited by the chiffonnier for there is never anything in them worth his searching for the porters of these houses are tailors or shoemakers their wives stocking menders or housemaids to all the lodgers these people with their offspring for they have children look like vegetables grown in a cellar there is no vestige of life health or strength in them the babies happily for them are sent as soon as born to some farm where the farmer's wife suckles two or three besides her own in paris to fulfil the duties of maternity is a luxury enjoyed only by the higher classes and though it is grand for philanthropists to point out that every mother should nurse her own child it would be necessary that the lodgings and most of the circumstances of the lower classes should undergo radical changes before such a practice would not be a sure means of deteriorating 
nay diminishing a greater portion of the working population in the country the children of the poor find sufficient food for a woman is rarely cruel to a baby even though it is not her own sufficient air and exercise till the age of four or five years thus sowing the seeds of a good constitution to help it through the miseries and privations and excesses of a parisian life in these dark streets in these almost dilapidated houses dwell perhaps the very merriest of the parisian population and certainly that portion most characteristic of the manners and habits of the french people our young student fresh from the provinces comes to paris with an allowance commensurate with the straitened means of his father or his straitened ideas of the exigencies of a parisian life he secures for two hundred francs a year a lodging said to be furnished then he has his books his own wardrobe often very unfitted for the life and passion of his society and there surrounded by similar establishments he takes his abode for three years fellow-students become his friends instantaneously by them he is initiated into the resources of student life in paris with them he goes to dine at a restaurateur's for fifteen sous and breakfast there for five what he gets for this sum is not to be inquired into it satisfies with the help of fabulous masses of bread his youthful and not squeamish appetite and with a little imagination he fancies he is faring sumptuously for the external symptoms of sordid poverty are hidden under the outward appearances of white tablecloths silver spoons and forks clean glasses and tidy gay-looking rooms the student rarely crosses the seine why should he if the other side has its tuileries has he not his luxembourg with its palace and picture gallery its groves of waving lilacs and drooping acacias its statues its fountains and its long shady avenues the palace a memorial of marie de medici's love for her florentine associations and her early days was built on the model of the Pitti palace at florence the ceilings were painted by rubens who also painted a triumphal history of the queen mother of france but the painter was no prophet and could not add the dark closing scene in the garret at cologne where marie once the object of richelieu's passion expiated her ridicule of his pretensions and her own restless ambition she the wife of henry of france and navarre by a lingering death from starvation and neglect now these gilded chambers and galleries beautiful specimens of the florid renaissance school have been given to the public rubens and his pictorial flatteries have been removed to the louvre and a gallery has been formed of modern rubenses roqueplan de la roche biard vernet court living painters of france enjoying during their lifetime the admiration and enthusiasm of their fellow-citizens every sunday the people literally the people in sabots vests and blues come to look at these pictures recording most of them events of the present century scenes from that modern iliad so endear to the people the era of napoleon the students arm in arm with some gay pink bonneted grisette much enjoy playing cicerone to an eager assemblage of listeners describing in the familiar language of the people and the picturesque imagery of bombast the heroic deeds recorded on the canvas soldiers too who have come from the unknown and inglorious campaigns of algiers where so much blood has been shed so many brave deeds accomplished without result or fame will love to trace in the egyptian campaign of vernet many familiar places and uniforms such as he has seen them too though at a later period all this crowd pass on to the throne-room to the bedchamber of marie de medici to the council-room in fact through all the magnificence of the palace without either rudeness or noise without any feeling of envy but with a ready comprehension of the artistic beauties around there is no need to watch this populace for nothing is touched injured or destroyed the luxembourg held too the chamber of peers as long as there were peers and many a battle has been fought between the soldiers and the populace during the many political trials which followed the advent of the citizen king now all is peaceable the children sport about their nurses and the soldiers sit love-making upon the stone benches around the graver student artists yet without the great battlefield of fame men with the spirit of their genius brooding within and preparing themselves to vault into the arena of life 
paced slowly up and down this long avenue dark and shady from its thick foliage in the brightest days of summer here mused robespierre when contemplating wild theories of philanthropy which he solved in blood and persecution here arm in arm the young enthusiastic girondins have walked pouring forth the poetry and dreams of liberty and heroism here madame roland leaning on the arm of bernave or of barbaroux would talk those sublime impossibilities which women in troublous times will talk to those they love here later the beautiful madame tallien with her classical draperies copied from the greek her bare and jewelled feet displayed in ancient sandals sauntered with her less beautiful though fascinating companion madame de beauharnais whilst senators directors all the officers civil and military of that most dangerous government the directoire followed in their footsteps madame tallien gabarus was generous good and witty and so beautiful that painter nor sculptor nor david nor canova could find one fault in either face or form josephine de beauharnais so graceful so winning so sprightly yet so gentle had power too for then she was the acknowledged favourite of the ruler barras her notice it was that first gave distinction to the man bravery and heroism were scarcely distinctions then when all men were brave and all women had passed through danger with heroism who afterwards of the widow of the royalist and the mistress of the republican made at once an empress and a queen now towards dark bounding through this avenue rather traced by the sound of their merry laugh than by their gaily dressed forms come our students and their gay careless companions the grisettes on their way to the sunday termination of all parties of pleasure the far-famed garden of the chaumiere there is nothing remarkable as a garden enclosed within the high walls of chaumiere it is not for instance to be compared with the luxembourg which they have just left but it has lawns of soft green turf surrounded by little tents and arbours and above all it has most delicious orchestras playing perpetually polkas waltzes and contredances it has too retired alleys dimly lighted with coloured lamps and it has a foreshadowing of a railroad called a montagne russe consisting of one inclined plane placed opposite another so that an impetus once given a little fantastic car containing two rushes at lightning speed down one and up the other great is the shouting the laughing the struggling the tearing the romping but great also seems the enjoyment the dance however has the preference towards the end of the evening here the excitement of the day comes to a climax in the wildest inspiration of unheard of inconceivable untaught and unteachable steps and figures in vain the stiff gendarme interferes he stops one enthusiast and another rushes into the field these capricious dances are forbidden by the prudish police of the popular balls though when clad in spanish costume they are applauded on the stage of the grand opera students and grisette dance merrily away pausing merely to take refreshments of lemonade soda water currant syrups a species of dignified pie crust galette by name cold veal and fresh salads there are none but young people here people without cares position or responsibility pleasure the pleasure of the day of the moment their only aim so they eat laugh dance talk and flirt till the tired waiters slumber as they stand the musicians sleep over their instruments and the lamps go out then untired untamed and laughing still they rush down the rue saint jacques dancing as they go to various streets and alleys noisily screaming good night and waking the slumbering bourgeois with their pleasantries and fun and so they seek their homes to dream of not the intoxication of wine or spirits for drunkenness is unknown in this class but the delirium of youth liberty and love End of chapter six chapter seven of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain the theatres and the press the gas is lighted along the boulevards it streams from all the cafes but it lights only gilded and painted solitudes the dominoes have ceased to rattle on the marble tables 
the dame de comptoir seated in state leans back in her enthroned chair casts one glance at her pretty person in the surrounding mirrors then produces from some secret drawer the last new novel of paul de coq rigaud or paul feval and forgets her troubles in those of the heroines before her the waiters loll around the doors or flap the flies with their napkins or noisily express their private opinions of politics women the arts and affairs in general all the world is at the theatres the carriages flashing by convey the great and fashionable to the opera or the italien the peaceful fiacre takes the less pretentious and along the asphalt pavement arm and arm go the modest bourgeoise with her husband the workman in a clean blouse with his neat and merry wife whilst artists and editors saunter after with the easy elegant impudent air of a class having a comfortable conviction of its own merits fully conscious of its power and fully aware how to use it the grand opera the school of so many others where the worst part is the singing and the best the dancing where pageantry reigns supreme but in such perfection that instead of vulgar parades we have artistic pictures of bygone scenes and ages grouped as by a painter's art where the orchestra is made up of artists each a master of his art imbued with the spirit of harmony drilled by innumerable rehearsals and with no fault except that they forget there are singers in their wake and that voices can but shout and dare not sing if they would be heard above the din of a hundred musicians blowing scraping and drumming with all their hearts and souls still the orchestra of the grand opera is the finest in the world so is the singing only they don't go well together but the ballet that is the real thing here an assemblage of youth and grace conventional it is true but still grace for all that fresh elegant dresses smiles flowers white arms small feet and slim ankles eyes which know where to look to seek for applause and bouquets no wonder the side boxes fill no wonder that moustaches of every hue quiver over the parapet that editors and writers of dramatic feuilletons are so much courted here is a whole phalanx of protégés dancing themselves into public favour fortune and distinction and a whole host of protectors applauding helping and admiring ah the press is a great power in france for there newspapers are a medium for other interests than mere local politics stock exchange reports and civic twaddle paris lives as much for the intellectual as for the material the very men who toil and chaffer all day read a theatrical critique or an artistic review with as much interest and unction as they do a money article true your parisian journalist pays a price for this way he has through years and years educated the public and now the public can judge him he cannot write carelessly or faithlessly or ill he must be well informed witty sarcastic intelligent he must have a style he must have ideas he must choose not merely string his words and so like those houris who dance through the ballet a mere shade or gleam in a great picture one day to come forth stars like taglioni grisi grands and rosati the journalist serves a hard apprenticeship first he does the drudgery of paste and scissors then the reclame or puffs then he is set to producing canards or humbugs events invented names and all to fill some special mission of puffery the have we a bourbon among us question was one of the best puffs ever contrived in the united states where it must be confessed the press in this especial department is no whit behind that of paris then the apprentice journalist is set to writing leading articles for some lazy editor which are signed with the editor's name till finally a chance which is said to happen once in every man's life and in newspaper and literary life may happen every day brings him in propria personae before the public there is less envy and jealousy amongst the women of italy than in any other country because beauty is more general there than elsewhere it is perhaps because there is more talent among the french journalists that there is less envy and bitterness than in the press of other countries there is a struggle but with fair weapons intellect and talent and there is a thorough esprit de corps the rights of one are the rights of all the position of one is the position of all then they are a genial social body they have a society of their own 
joyous brilliant they strive not for official sinecures as a goal they aim not at conventionality or prudish gentility they love the luxury of refinement but they love not the forms of ceremony or the trammels of rule they are generous warm-hearted easy and elegant in manner squandering freely both their wit and their money devoted in their friendship and not over scrupulous in their loves they let not one golden drop of enjoyment fall from the cup of life admitted into all circles the press and artistic world of paris form a circle outside of all others which is their own peculiar home and sphere the magnificent abodes of the queens of the drama are their trysting places here night after night month after month year after year the sparkle of wit and champagne has crowned the evening when all toil is done the critique of the play or opera written on some malachite or bowl table in the hostess's drawing-room within hearing of the gay laugh the punning and pungent repartee from the supper-room conveys to the morning paper some of the grace and sparkle whence it sprung the gamay from the printing office knows the various haunts and startles with the magic words more copy one guest after another from his place in paris there is no starring system for favourites they begin in one theatre and there they make their fortune and position so that actors and actresses have permanent if not legitimate homes here as around some planet revolve all the other members of the artistic world the women are nearly all beautiful clever graceful witty and if not learned appreciative a parisienne knows everything by instinct and as for the men they include everything that is rich handsome noble renowned or intelligent from the highest station near the throne to the most insignificant and unknown penny a liner though the position of many of the guests particularly the ladies is not very orthodox and their morals will not bear much scrutiny there is no license notwithstanding the great liberty of conversation nor do these representatives of the arts offend good taste by any freedom of action excepting that the women are more beautiful and the men more witty there is scarcely any difference between a salon in bohème the nickname of the artistic world and a salon of the chaussee d'antin bohème is what confers great power on the press with such allies what a large circle can they not command all the frequenters of these artistic salons are allies not of managers speculators bankers or booksellers but of the journalists whom they see and know and who belong to the circle that meets there therefore it is that in france alone the royal we oui of the press has had its full royal acceptation in france it is as good nay often better as times have sometimes gone to be a journalist than a king but now at the grand opera all these joyous children of bohème are at their work the first year has filled with all the rank and fashion of the higher spheres divided into private boxes holding four or six it is mauvais ton to have more than two ladies in one box as a display of grace and draperies would be impeded this portion of the audience have taken their seats in these boxes the toilettes are decidedly ball or even court costumes you will see many of these ladies rise before the last act and leave the house for the various embassies the faubourg saint germain or the tuileries above in the second tier are simpler dresses the boxes are filled to their capacities the attention to the performance is greater and the visitors are fewer below in orchestra and pit are none but men no woman is admitted to such very uncomfortable places as a perpetually changing pit affords in every country but there is an intermediate state a sort of purgatory between the paradise of the boxes and the pandemonium of the pit called the amphitheatre this is five or six rows raised at the back of the pit fenced in with gilded balustrades and containing comfortable armchairs a woman with any pretensions to fashion or distinction would rather never go to the opera in her life than sit here though the seats are quite as dear as anywhere else fashion has abandoned these places to the unknown the provincials les anglaises and the dowdy between the gilded columns which divide the house on either side are the boxes of the various ministers given away each day by the ministers themselves to some of the higher employés those four proscenium boxes so gorgeous with mirrors velvet and gilding 
represent the three powers of society the lower one to the left is the imperial box the one opposite belongs to the royalty of wealth represented by aguado marquis de las marismas once a retailer of spanish wines now a grandee of spain and a financier of rothschild proportions above is the royalty of politics typified by the ambassador of austria and opposite him the royalty of fashion represented by the various bearded faces and gloved hands of the members of the jockey club or loge des lions to this box are directed all the glances the pirouettes and even the roulade and the passionate appeals of the mimic scene with real meanings there at some decisive moment sits enthroned some dreaded feuilletonist courted by the protector of the dancer or singer now in action flattered fawned on by the lion who ferocious and supercilious to all are gentle and genial to the almighty journalist the draught his pen can draw on fame is as valuable to the fair postulant o oh, splendid lion as the draughts which yours can draw for her upon your banker it is not a clique or a claque or bouquets or a bonbon that can make a success it is a word of praise from théophile gautier carr or Janet. you will not persuade the public accustomed to these oracles to listen to the fiat of any other geoffrey the critic made talma and Janet made rachel caused her step by step with inexorable judgment to rise from a prodigy uncultivated and wild to a genius refined classical passionate and sublime there are fifteen theatres in paris one would scarcely think to look at the yawning parquette and solitary dress circles of most of our american theatres that fifteen could nightly keep open in one city and perform too to crowded and enthusiastic audiences yet so it is each theatre has its peculiar style its special actors and its special audience of course there are always restless interlopers and wandering foreigners in each theatre but if you yourself become an habitué you will soon know at sight all the boxes have a bowing acquaintance with the pit and a confidential friendship with the stalls the stalls the resort of criticism and the hard-to-be-pleased old gentleman who in the presence of a modern prodigy is sure to remember some great bygone celebrity of his youth and to shake his head sadly as the applause thunders around him ah monsieur will he say with a faint smile how duchenois said that or how mademoiselle georges looked this part ah monsieur we shall never replace the actors of my youth the actors dread the stalls more than any other part of the house it is not the genius of their predecessors they cannot rival it is the feelings of youth hope and love which they cannot rouse in the hearts of those old grey-headed men before them with withered affections and bitter knowledge of the world the stalls of the théâtre francais in the rue richelieu listened unmoved to rachel for many months before they roused to enthusiasm her genius required no inspiration but her industry was urged to study by the deep damnation of their bas the audience of the théâtre francais is however at all times a very formidable one composed of the literati of the most refined and educated of the higher classes those who with every element of fashion beauty fame riches refinement and rank are too sensible to be fashionable and to frequent operas only another feature of this theatre is the number of young girls among the audience for you must know that in france young girls are rarely taken to the theatre passion of any kind however pure is not thought to be the fit thing for young minds and the double entendre and the intrigues of comedies and vaudevilles would pollute the ears and fire the imaginations of beings with whom ignorance and innocence are synonymous a very little observation will enable you to distinguish this one peculiarity of french life une demoiselle her condition varies little in all stations of life revolutions innovations reformations restorations or usurpations have never altered her condition for centuries although the convent walls are not as frequent the education without them is as strictly conventual as in those days when a girl stepped from the convent to the court learning at the altar in the morning for the first time the name of her husband under whose roof she slept that night look 
do you not see that box there are two ladies both young both graceful both pretty both exquisitely dressed but oh how different they are the one to the right has flowers in her bonnet her dress is in the most recent fashion open in front and amidst falls of beautiful lace the white throat is visible and the swelling bosom just perceptible the rich and waving lace sleeves the handsome bracelets the jewelled lorgnette the falling cashmere draperied so artistically the sparkling eye the laughing mouth and the gay and continued conversation with the men who fill the box all this reveals a woman in the happiest state of french existence that is the first few years of her married life now look at her sister the dress of sober coloured silk high to the throat the neatest of all collars in simple embroidery no lace anywhere not even on her handkerchief nothing but a simple scallop and her name embroidered by her own hand no chains no bracelets a plain velvet band with a silver buckle clasps her waist she wears no brooches no flowing shawl bernou or other coquettish invention with which fashion forms a background for her portraits her bonnet is of plain crape with a white pink or blue ribbon the only three colours allowed to girls white the colour of innocence pink the insignia of youth and never worn by any woman over thirty and blue the colour consecrated to the patroness of the young girls the virgin mary she has no flowers no lorgnette heavens she might discover that there were other men in creation besides her brother and her cher papa a fact she is now supposed to ignore her eyes are modestly cast down or immutably fixed upon the stage a ready blush and a demure oui monsieur or non monsieur is her limit of conversation such is the young lady une demoiselle in her state of probation come again in a month or two and probably she will be metamorphosed into an elegant woman of fashion a feat achieved as quickly as the change from the word mademoiselle to madame is effected in the magistrate's office and in the church oh a parisian woman une parisienne is a wonderful product of civilization balzac their historian says they know everything without ever learning anything and so you would think if you watched this shy silent demure young girl emerged into a jeune femme she becomes at once as if by magic gay elegant witty full of taste of amiability thoroughly acquainted with the literature of the day perfectly posted in the chronique scandaleuse knows who gave mademoiselle so-and-so her diamond necklace and who interests himself in the new danseuse she can tell you which horse will win the steeplechase at the croix de berny and who will be sent to the crimea in case anything should happen to general canrobert with all this she is a charming good-tempered wife making her home a bright emanation got up for her husband's special gratification in due time she is a devoted mother never forgetting to be a true and affectionate daughter to the home she has left and finally she becomes a cheerful sensible old woman neither envious nor querulous claiming respect not admiration loving that you should enjoy its pleasures content to be old honoured and loved in the many homes of her married children where with her simple dress her silver hair her gentle but faded face with its still bright eye and its ever sweet smile she fills the place of honour but how far we have wandered come let us leave andromache and roxalane the classical on the stage and the orthodox in the boxes and come into the centre of fun frolic and fifi on along the boulevards to one of its theatres the variete never mind the stage though that is the abode of fun the origin of half the jokes one hears every day at the cafes and clubs and the purveyor-general of all the farces enacted in the english tongue on both sides of the atlantic now the public of this theatre is principally made up of actresses yes those young lovely clever warm-hearted careless utterly devoid of talent actresses who have appeared and disappeared in rapid succession on the minor stages of paris they rose from obscurity from the dark and dirty loge of the portieres in the small streets in the old portion of the cité they have known poverty toil and want they have learned at incredible expense of perseverance and industry 
the various accomplishments necessary to warrant them in offering themselves as candidates for publicity all has been difficulty and hard work even to the very language they are to speak on the stage so different from the slovenly incorrect ungrammatical but picturesque dialect they have heard in list from their infancy off the stage they speak it still on the stage they speak the words of the author never varying a vowel or adding a syllable for if they did they would assuredly be wrong these young ladies once en vue that is placed on the pedestal of the stage soon find appreciators and admirers they are not sentimental or cruel and their admirers do not sigh long in vain they are however often conscientious and faithful and in a few months we find them solving one of the most extraordinary arithmetical problems ever heard of in which it is proved that instead of one hundred francs a month making twelve hundred francs a year it often makes twelve fifteen and even twenty-five thousand a year a grave old parisian judge having got one of these renowned jeunes premières into the witness-box some time ago resolved to get all the financial information he could on the occasion so he began how much do you receive from the variété mademoiselle Ozy? such was and is the name of the culprit twelve hundred francs a year what do you pay for house rent two thousand a year you have a carriage i have and three horses servants four diamonds i know for the court has just been discussing the bill for their resetting what is the value of the india shawl you have on three thousand francs your rooms are well furnished from the best fournisseur i have some valuable pictures too and you receive twelve hundred francs a year mademoiselle you should be minister of finance and not jeune premier how do you manage mademoiselle Ozy looked through her long eyelids enveloped herself tightly in her cashmere so as to display the ins and outs of her exquisite form advanced a little foot with its high arched instep made a graceful curtsey to the judge and faltered in a clear thrilling voice monsieur le juge nothing can be easier j'ai un ami there is the secret the ami is a rich man varying in rank from the peer to the shopkeeper but oftener to be found in the rank of the financier of the chaussee d'antin he has somewhere in the vicinity of notre dame de lorette an establishment where he takes his ease puts his dusty boots unchidden on the velvet sofas orders dinner when he pleases invites his friends and smokes his cigar without apology or rebuff the variété is the favourite resort of the ami because there he runs no risk of meeting any of the society in which his mother wife or daughter moves men of his own class are there but they are bent on expeditions similar to his own so all's safe ensconced in the back of the box the front is left for the full display of the elaborate toilettes and brilliant beauty of the ladies for two there generally are as they are fond of the society of their own sex and the pleasure of outdressing and outshining each other adds zest to the enjoyment and satisfaction of being pretty and fine here at length you will for the first time since you have been in paris see those toilettes displayed in the fashion plates and studiously copied to a shade three months after date by the bells of broadway chestnut street and washington street here as there neither flounce nor feather flower nor furbelo is spared how the skirts flow from the taper waist over inflated crinoline how deep the lace wherever lace can be how long the ribbons wherever ribbons can stream how expensive the silks how fanciful the forms how gorgeous the varied hues for these fair ladies too are invented those marvellous morning wrappers with beflounced underskirts gold cordeliere and queer polkas a parisienne knows them and eschews them as she would the people who alone delight in them but an american or an englishwoman will pounce upon them revel in their oddity and take them home with the conviction that she is a model for all those fortunate enough to come within the rustle of her skirt how merry are all these parties and how the pit loves to look at them to see the actresses in private life though at the same distance is so much more amusing than to see them on the stage how obsequious is the ouvreuse 
women perform the office of box-keepers in france how ready is the petit bon footstool an inestimable luxury unknown in american theatres which it is their province and their perquisite to offer to all the occupants of the boxes what fragrant bouquets adorn the cushioned balustrade of each box and how many bonbons are crunched between the pearly teeth of these children of pleasure however rich the amis these prudent though spoiled children never give up their situation on the stage it keeps them ever before the public it amuses them to invent dresses and costumes and being actresses they are not classed among the lorette which latter look at them quite with envy and respect then if by any chance their good looks or acting obtain applause it serves to fan the flame of their often times careless admirer and if they should happen to have one spark of talent why they rise to celebrities and often change places with those who once protected them the freaks of fortune in the financial and artistic world are so extraordinary to the credit of these fair and frail beings be it spoken they are never ungrateful but give with kind and generous profusion to those who once were kind and generous to them End of chapter seven chapter eight of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain the odeon the grisette and franconiste our last chapter long as it is was not long enough to include all the theatres of paris so we must again cross the seine and recommence our enumeration beginning now with the odeon the only theatre in the faubourg st germain the largest the handsomest and the least frequented theatre in paris there are probably thousands of theatre goers who have never been within its walls it is called the second theatre francais and depends on the government and management of the francais of the rue richelieu here it is that that stately establishment tries its young actors and plays its old pieces and here it is that the student and the grisette cultivate their taste for the drama an audience noisy and exacting but by no means unappreciative or cold the grisette have all a woman's instincts her sensibility her love of the marvellous her excitability and the students are severe judges classical scholars when they choose to remember it having also a quick eye for the ludicrous and a warm heart and stentorian lungs for the heroic and magnanimous in this theatre you will see almost every individual occupied either with oranges apples bonbons or galette but the favourite pastime consists in eating those large fragrant browned roasted chestnuts which in winter tempt you at the corner of every street the grisette's apron pockets are full of them her companion's pockets are full of them and there is a further supply in the pocket handkerchief by her side these chestnuts are hot and the ceremony of divesting them of their skins and of eating them gives rise to most expressive pantomimic evolutions for they sometimes burn the fingers sometimes the mouth and sometimes that part which comes in contact with the pocket when a man sits down how they shout how they caper what faces they make and above all how they laugh sometimes one of these rollicking behoys in the boxes will spy a friend in the pit and then without further ceremony he rises and having caught his attention carries on a confidential conversation in the hearing of the whole house no matter what is going on upon the stage if bocage is ranting our student only shouts the louder in order to outshout bocage at this theatre the obsequious box-keeper as usual a woman has almost a sinecure people dash about from one place to another without consulting her they go from the première galerie up to the paradis and then down to the pit without so much as raising their hats so she generally ends by sitting down in the corner of an unoccupied box and knitting quietly her good man's stockings sometimes however she may see a good-natured grisette or two whom she knows then it is her delight to sit down by them and relate anecdotes of all the actresses she has known all the wonderful changes of fortune that have happened to her she was of course a thoroughly unappreciated actress in her younger days and a deposed beauty infallibly then she will advise her hearers as to their prospects in life 
or listen to complaints of some mauvais sujet philemon adolphe or theodore who is scampering over the house with his graceless companions or she will sympathize with the sentiment for sir cher alfred or sir pauvre auguste who is so fond and so devoted to his cher anastasie or aspasie or olympe grisettes are as fond as negroes of fine names whom his embêtant professor has detained over some absurd study now it is a remarkable thing that this ouvreuse who in her day has probably been renowned for her gallantry though she will give some very shrewd advice as to the management of a rich lover still appreciates in the highest degree the value of a true affection she takes the deepest interest in all the details of such an attachment and with a sigh from her very heart a tear in her eye and a pinch of snuff between her fingers will exclaim ah ma petite true love is after all better than riches or fine clothes the grisette who frequent the odeon though perfectly unacquainted with etiquette manners or savoir vivre laughing loudly when pleased crying quite as obstreperously when affected by some deep tragedy eating incessantly and pointing across the house at their friends are not women of disreputable conduct or women who come here to seek their fortune they would reject a liberty or an impertinence quite as quickly and much more violently than any more staid or prudish lady a strange class are these grisettes and by foreigners how little are they known or understood in the first place the origin of their very name is perverted and the word grisette is supposed to mean an infamous class of women from whom they are as different and as far removed as they are from the timid young bourgeoise who has never left her mother's side grisette is nothing more than an historical name and means simply the wife or daughter of a burgher or a citizen who first by royal edicts and latterly by custom wore cloaks and dresses of sober grey gris all gorgeous colours being reserved for the silks and velvets of the dames and gallants of the luxurious courts la robe grise belonged to civil magistrates and the noblesse who often found prettier faces in their tailor's shop than in their own homes gave the pretty and graceful diminutive to the whole class of citizens wives and daughters and called them grisettes but as luxury and extravagance progressed in one class and thrift and riches increased in the other kings and nobles were forced to come to burghers and tradesmen for loans and credit then of course if there was accommodation on one side there were necessarily concessions on the other so that after a while rich grisettes began to infringe on the brighter and interdicted class then some burghers richer and more generous than others were by the grateful and needy lords invited to court some were presented to the king until finally the money-lenders bankers brokers etc became fermiers généraux the magnificent fouquet crowning the whole race you will easily imagine that the ladies had not been backward in profiting by all these honours and favours so that very shortly all distinction of dress ceased the traditional grey coat and robe were laid aside and the traditional word grisette though still retained descended a few grades it now means absolutely a young girl who earns her own living but it refers entirely to position and does not necessarily mean anything bad the character or reputation of a grisette may be as depraved or as virtuous as that of a princess whom in either case we call a princess now although this is theoretically exact yet a strictly virtuous grisette that is to say a girl thoroughly chaste who gives her heart only when she gives her hand like any other girl of family and position is not to be found except in the mysteries of paris where eugene sue has realized the species in rigolette but then the grisette's code of morality is not the same as that of the educated social world a virtuous grisette according to the grisette code means a girl who is faithful to one attachment who never has but one lover at a time and who does not change often the code of the grisette admits of no mercenary views and though she will not refuse a barret shawl sixteen francs or a pink bonnet ten francs or a tulle cap six francs from her beloved still she is quite as ready to give him a black silk cravat gloves handkerchiefs or anything within reach of her purse and between the student's purse and the grisette's the balance is often in favour of the latter it is singular though obvious that there is a great difference in refinement between the two sexes of the same class 
the workman and the grisette and thus naturally the grisette with her gentle voice her white hands her cat-like cleanliness is more suited to be the companion of young men of family and refinement if not of fortune than of rough-handed blustering workmen in these connections the advantage is entirely on the side of the man the grisette has all the cares of the community she comes for they do not positively reside together every morning before going to her day's work and puts some kind of order in the most disorderly of apartments she mends the shirts sews on the stray buttons and gives the things to the wash protection kindness and affection she gets in return but then she too is a tender nurse in sickness a never-failing friend in sorrow and as fond of him in the dark days as in the bright she exacts nothing but she expects to be fetched every evening from the boutique where she works to be taken out every sunday to be taken to see all the melodramas and once a year to be taken to the opera where the nakedness and attitudes of the dancers excite her wonder and shock her modesty then she must be perpetually supplied with sweet meats chocolate and chestnuts a bottle of cider or small beer must be occasionally offered walnuts and galette must be for ever on hand and you mustn't think any other grisette pretty though you may admire and she will admire with you the beauty and grace of any grande dame who falls in your way one of the hardest things for a student who leaves the schools and returns to his province or his home to assume his station and profession is to part with this kind-hearted partner of his youthful life and here is the rubicon of the grisette's destiny if she gets reckless if she forms too lightly another liaison and so change again and again then she loses caste and sinks till she is lost to all who knew her and loved her but usually as the grisette always has occupation and never depends on any but herself for support she takes steadily to work cries a little gets gradually a little older and is often before thirty the well-conducted well-looking wife of a hard-working mechanic or if she remain unmarried she becomes either partner with her employers or première demoiselle of the establishment which gives her two hundred francs per month the ambigu on the boulevards is also a great resort of this riotous and romping portion of the population eschewing the boulevard des italiens des capucines etc they congregate their pleasures on the boulevard du temple where in summer they delight in the jardin turc placed conveniently near three or four of the smaller theatres the gaiete the funambule the ambigu and franconi's yes franconi's where dramas are performed where horses take parts where the whole campaign of italy is enacted where napoleon seated on a real white horse as in david's picture really harangues real soldiers who can be hired as supernumeraries which saves much drilling and where all ascend to italy and glory over stupendous pasteboard alps here too a heroic poniotowski and his long-maned horse leap into a flowing ulster also like the picture of that hero by vernet great is the delight of the audience but more particularly of the grisettes who adore napoleon sympathize with josephine and apostrophize the sham marie louise whenever she appears in good round terms for her base desertion while some student well versed in the imperial history fills up the hiatuses of the drama with anecdotes explanations and running commentaries all uttered in a loud tone for the benefit of those around him between some of the eight or ten acts franconi thinks nothing of that there is a dash out of the student and the grisette a plunge into the cafe turc a miraculous absorption of ice creams or jatte and watery syrup a practical joke upon some old fogey a compliment to the pretty lady who takes your money a sprinkling of coppers to the gamin and then a rush back again with hands full of cakes and if the act has not begun an inveterate stamping shrieking and whistling till napoleon and his generals do the reverse of what they did in reality bring peace and tranquillity the workmen or mechanics have a profound admiration for the students and entertain very exalted but vague ideas of their immense learning and science they love their never flagging spirits their witticisms their jokes and have a great esteem for the carelessness of their costume a dandy being the abomination of the people of paris together the people and the students have made and unmade a good many governments the assemblies on the boulevard saint martin or a descent from the faubourg saint antoine 
are causes of great anxiety but when the students des écoles cross the seine and head the mob then come the days of barricades fighting and convulsion and yet these very men both students and people have an unmitigated admiration love and enthusiasm for napoleon who was the sovereign of despotism who decimated their ranks and led them to die on the sandy plains of egypt and the frozen steppes of russia but then he appealed to their imagination and flattered their vanity two great points which we recommend to the consideration of all political leaders End of chapter eight chapter nine of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain a bal masqué and the literati is a bal masqué a pleasure does the real spirit of fun animate it is it really so superior to all other diversions as to merit the interdictions of the prudish and the rhapsodies of the unscrupulous these are questions which have been agitated by several generations without ever having received any decided fiat or resolution from any century though the present one comes nearer to the solving of the problem than any other has done by almost universally eschewing the soi-disant merry bal masqué for it is a popular error to imagine that the parisians revel in their carnivals in dominoes and masks ladies are not nowadays when they seek more for general effect and less for private admiration fond of hiding their faces under a mask or their figures under the heavy and really concealing folds of a black domino a black domino and mask why where are the glories of costume and the fancies of historical conceits then gone passed away now without exception the only costume a woman of reputation can wear at a masked ball is as i said a black domino with a large hood made of black silk closed from the head to the feet and a black velvet or silk mask the only distinction allowed her is in her chaussure which provided it is black may be as elegant as she pleases and in her gloves which if they are white and she desires to keep them so must be changed two or three times in the course of the evening as to the men there is not one of them with any claims to respectability whoever puts on either costume mask or domino always however excepting our student of the quartier latin a few provincials and some ignorant or misguided foreigner now here are not the elements of a brilliant ball and when we add that at a masked ball at least at the only one still frequented the grand opera there is no dancing it will be found that a bal masqué owes its fictitious charms to the imagination of its votaries or to some extraneous circumstance of which more anon there are however during the carnival masked balls at every theatre besides those at public rooms such as musard's valentino's the casino etc etc but if you love not wit without mirth license without writ or a woman without modesty a peep of five minutes into any one of these modern saturnalias will more than suffice to give you a proper idea of the obscene realities of the bal masqué of your poetical and historical imaginings of all these the bal musard is the most remarkable and the most characteristic an immense space well decorated brilliantly lighted a delicious orchestra which for certain kinds of music dance music as the germans call it has become proverbial and which before the strausses and juliennes had arisen in imitation had no equal give musard's ballroom great advantage over all its impure fellows here the comme il faut domino is scarcely to be seen and men and women are all in fanciful gay and even rich costumes the women with very bare shoulders and the slightest apology for a mask hiding but just enough of the face to give piquancy to the rest the men are in every species of grotesque disguise from the traditional polichinelle and classic pierrot all sleeves and ribbons to the modern robert macaire all rags and rascality the women here are noisy rough and bold if a pretty tournure or what you can see of a pretty face should tempt you to a nearer acquaintance forbear her name is in all probability inscribed on that register of infamy kept by the police of paris the list of those wretched women 
whose existence would seem to be one of the necessities of civilization as it now stands now hour after hour this mad reckless meeting has been growing more riotous more hideous yelling drinking quarrelling till the witches sabbath in the hearts mountains pales before their orgies and now after a short pause in the orchestra scarcely perceived amidst the din of the floor the signal for the final galop is given to witness this far-famed galop de musard almost all paris has been clandestinely within these forbidden walls closely masked under the protection of their husbands carefully attended by a gendarme whom the husbands have hired for that purpose ladies stationed for a few minutes on the highest benches have looked down on the crowd beneath with a loud crash the orchestra begins then in mad whirl eighty or a hundred couples start with shouts and yells as if impelled by the infernal power that sent dante's damned in one eternal whirl through the murky air on on quicker yet quicker still over all obstacles spite of all fatigues still breathing changes to sobs and shouts become groans till the long hair of the women shedding its ornaments at each step streams over their panting bosoms till the mask sodden with perspiration literally crumbles from the face of the men to stumble or fall in this whirl of insane revelry is death the crowd will pass heedless over not even stopping to kick the prostrate body from its path but crushing it out of all life or shape nor does this end till all have thrown themselves exhausted on the benches around and are taken by the gendarme in the delirium of a brain fever to their homes if they have them to the hospital or the corps de garde if they have not very different is the only ball to which we can go the bal de l'opera though here after your curiosity is gratified unless you have inspired some secret passion which is waiting this opportunity to declare itself or unless you are gifted with that conversation which keeps wit afloat and throws a repartee from one to the other as jugglers do their balls i question whether you will not yawn at the end of the first hour before the second is over you will be fast asleep dreaming that you have had the courage to go home and are sound in your bed instead of sitting on a hard bench propped up against a stuccoed wall with three gas burners flaring over your head and a sombre procession of women looking like grand inquisitors laughing somewhat contemptuously at you as they pass if they notice you at all which they are generally too much occupied to do but the orchestra peals away unceasingly the motley swarm pushes crowds and jokes in the jammed pit and on the stage the boxes are filled with dominoes and with rows of well-dressed provincials innumerable english and americans sitting soberly and gravely looking down and around wondering when the dancing is to begin which it never does after a polka of five minutes executed by order of the managers by a few figurants and ballet girls and convinced that there is no doubt a great deal of fun going on if they could only find it out now my dear naive novices there is a great deal going on a great deal of fun and much that is far more serious at least in what it leads to but this is not the place nobody you would care to see nothing you care to know or understand is going on in the body of the house the bonne compagnie that for whom a bal masqué is still what it used to be in more corrupt perhaps but more courtly times a medium of intrigue of love and of wit all this is only to be seen in the saloon or foyer at twelve a masked ball does not begin till midnight you will find men with no sort of disguise sauntering into the foyer and seating themselves on the benches around then two or three women all strictly masked in the close black livery will come in arm in arm then one alone then others in threes and fours but all dressed alike and all unaccompanied by gentlemen in the foyer of the opera a woman under the protection of a mask is as safe from insult except such as her conversation may afterwards provoke as in her own drawing-room of course we are too well bred to make any attempt at discovering who may be hidden beneath these flowing veils of black silk though one could almost give a catalogue of the rank if not of the actual names of the wearers there are many great ladies ladies of historical names and reputations 
brought here by some overwhelming passion or bitter jealousy there are many giddy young married women of the chaussee d'antin here because les grandes dames are here all the very great actresses are here one can almost detect the majestic walk of rachel stalking solitary and sometimes looking round as if to accost her beloved young sister who is now no more all the femmes d'esprit are here that is all women who write but whom i won't call blue stockings because nothing is less like a blue stocking than a french authoress there i listened but an instant yet i recognized the sparkle of her wit light brilliant and unmistakable as the foam of champagne that is madame emile de girardin the vicomte de Launay of the siècle and near her is madame dago the grave and metaphysical danielle stern so long the companion of liszt and yonder though you can scarcely follow her restless movements is an english woman clever bright handsome and heartless having a thousand intrigues on hand caring for no one speaking every living language capricious as a sunbeam now wild as a bacchante smoking drinking riding and fighting now gentle pious prudish and devout a strict observer of the practices of the romish church that is the authoress of the best book on paris life mildred vernon of which you know nothing of many clever articles in the revue des deux mondes and is also the wife of a pale little poet much too slow and slight for so overwhelming a wife madame la baronne b blank de b blank is her name now rose s blank is the one she chose for neither father nor mother had one to give to her and hamilton murray is the name under which she writes but we are getting very indiscreet let us come to the bench opposite where all the ladies paused before the men who lolling with their hats on seem the very pashas of the evening there is jules janet with his twinkling black eyes his fine though sensual mouth his long black hair standing crisply out as though each were a shaft here used also to be balzac whose small hands and refined intellectual head seem not to belong to that coarse ill-clad body poor balzac the real genius of his age the painter of the manners of the century in which he lived how long he struggled with debts privations extravagant habits generous impulses checked by poverty till he found at last a wife after his own heart a widow noble as a czar of all the russias of whom she was a subject rich as a platina mine handsome affectionate and then having at last time to exist to breathe to enjoy he laid his head on his down pillow and surrounded by all he had ever desired or dreamed of died and there is alphonse carr the most sceptical satirical witty elegant of mortals who writes political squibs and sentimental novels and cuts fashionable womanhood into shreds who goes into ecstasies over a flower garden and loves his dog better than he does the poor girl who left home and family for his sake yonder is alexandre dumas he has said enough for himself and has made himself as well known as his books he promised a little while ago to come to america and seek some quiet asylum on the banks of the st lawrence or the ohio which certainly left him a pretty wide range but spite of his genius his happy audacity and his popularity here as unbounded as our boundaries he would never be happy long way from paris where he has now returned from an involuntary exile beyond the field of waterloo besides it is only necessary to look at him to see the unmistakable traces of that african descent of which he is as proud as john randolph of his infusion of pocahontas and yankee doodle with his southern antipathies would not make half so much of the author as he has of his works and there handsome and uncombed is alfred de musset who wrote the best of all the poems in the style of don juan there is saint beuve the elegant scholar and profound critic and there but did i not prophesy rightly the hour is not yet up and you are yawning in a few minutes you will be asleep to bed to bed End of chapter 9
or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain sentiments and cemeteries all french sentiments have a tendency to the dramatic that is the french are fond of a mise en scène and while fully comprehending the magnificent patriotism of brutus are also full of the feeling which led caesar to arrange his robe gracefully before he fell at the foot of pompey's statue over all that is repulsive or commonplace the french throw some concealing drapery they were the first who idealized and embellished with flowers wreaths gardens and vestiges of this world's luxuries the place where the dead cease from troubling more about the sordid interests of this life and where they rest for ever from all weariness and sorrow once the dead beth struggle over and the body consigned to the earth death seems to lose its horrors and the survivors seek by every means to link the loved ones now hidden from their sight with the family which once was theirs they treat the grave tenderly as though the silent tenant beneath could hear a harsh or unkind word they surround it with the flowers he most loved they remember the various epochs of his life his birthday his bridal day and the day on which he died and on their anniversaries fresh garlands are woven around the monument and crowns of immortelles hang on the stone that bears his name and that none may be uncared for even those who went down silent and alone to untended graves in quick oblivion even those strangers from distant homes dying unmourned unknown in a foreign land or those hapless ones to whom shame and crime have given nameless tombs or which the long grass waves that none may mark the spot there has been one day set apart for that population of many many generations over which we tread a day sacred not exclusively to the dead still linked by kindred to the world but sacred to all now mouldering into ashes le jour des morts it is emphatically called nor the scoffings of philosophy nor the storms of revolutions nor the coldness of scepticism have ever obliterated this day from the memories of the people on the first of november le jour des morts every cemetery in paris is crowded with one long and ever-changing procession in every grade of life and all in the deepest mourning let us too go to pere lachaise none of our dead lie here but here are the dead whose names are still in the living world heard above all others as in this city of the dead their stately monuments tower above the humbler and inglorious tombs from earliest dawn every species of vehicle including the omnibuses from every quartier of paris has been pouring forth its load at the wide gates of pere lachaise before you reach its avenues however you pass through a double line of stone masons which announces your approach to the funeral city here you are assailed as at a railroad terminus with cards offers of service and supplications for custom tombs fantastic mausoleums monumental columns or simple gravestones are offered you at the lowest prices your own designs are promised to be carried out in the smallest possible space of time or if you are satisfied with the ready-made designs of others why you may in three hours become possessor of quite an elegant family tomb happily we want none of these sorrowful tributes let us enter the garden had we been early enough we might have followed the procession of priests in all the solemn pomp of the roman catholic church winding from the chapel in the centre of the garden through all the alleys and sprinkling the graves on either side with holy water but you see by the well-trodden autumn leaves with which the wind has strewn the road the crowds have already been before us of course your first question is for the tomb of which you have heard so much of abelard and eloise the french romeo and juliet though eloise far more unhappy than the italian heroine burned with her love for years and years within her charnel house and for abelard there was no poison that could reunite them in one grave strange that a love in opposition to the laws of man and god a love fulminated against by the church of rome should have been held sacred by succeeding generations who still obey the same laws and recognize the same church yet under this monument a small and beautiful gothic chapel formed out of a portion of the paraclete the abbey in which abbey Allard was abbot the two now reposed together the statues we see further on making the alley look like a gallery of sculpture 
are mostly those of the generals of that wonderful era which has just passed before our eyes with its pageantry its marvellous victories and its hecatombs of warriors Foy, lefebvre messina with the names of battles for their epitaphs then other tombs the fame of whose tenants not evanescent like that of the hero of the battlefield still endures children not of the sword but of heaven-born genius and like heaven eternal here sleeps la fontaine surrounded by the heroes of his vivid fables here moliere talma garcia the father of malibran bellini the young and fair-haired child of italy sleeps here those crowns of laurel and white camellias evidently just placed on the marble steps show that some are still mindful of this lonely grave the offering is said to be an annual memento of gratitude on this day from gioletta grisi to the composer of i puritani his last work written for her here too is an exquisite monument a chapel of white marble erected over the remains of a russian princess demidoff is the name inscribed and many bear it still and until a few months ago when the war trumpet called the luxury-loving children of the czar to their icy home even in this very paris but none have remembered the one who sleeps here the marble columns have no flowers the classic purity of their outlines is undisturbed there is in another part of the cemetery you will see it presently another chapel even more exquisite than this though evidently modelled from it it stands too on more ground for a garden of choice flowers surrounds it and in winter fresh bouquets and even exotics though enduring but a day are brought to this tomb who rests beneath has never been revealed no name is inscribed on any portion of the monument which was executed after design sent for that purpose and paid for promptly and magnificently none ever have visited it but strangers and artists who come to admire the gardener paid regularly his very high charges furnishes the flowers and disposes them according to his order but none have ever prayed or wept over this beautiful tomb what name has love or hate hidden from the world under this pure marble it would take days to see all you would like to see here almost as many as to visit those monuments whose domes and spires are rising in the distance amidst the living paris but one of the great sights of pere lachaise is to look from its silent hills down at the wide extent of the busy city now spread with its arrowy seine at your feet the site of the cemetery was well chosen you may easily understand that the original possessor of these grounds now much extended was of those who know how to choose and enjoy all the good things of this world a jesuit and a priest the confessor of louis the fourteenth who gives his name to this great cemetery once lived here he was one of those who to ease and comfort and health are fond of joining luxury riches and the picturesque but this is le jour des morts let us not forget the humble graves many there are which appeal more strongly to the imagination and the heart than those more celebrated and gorgeous we have passed here is a tiny grave scarce two feet long its garden and its marble slab all covered with glass as if the mother would still shield her child from the winds and storms of heaven as heaven has forever shielded it from those of earth amidst the flowers you see are childish playthings some broken just as the little hand last left them here is a young girl's tomb under a glass case is the prayer-book and the white wreath of her first communion the unfinished embroidery with its long silk thread but waiting the hand to draw it but there it will rest immovable for ever many many graves particularly those of children have these inanimate memorials surviving the dead and pertaining now more to the living than to the dead whose once they were there are graves too not in marble but in common stone and even in wood with inscriptions that tell whole histories evoke vast images from your imagination and send it wandering into the regions of poetry and romance there are some also that bring the quick tears to your eyes as though you had known the being who thus speaks from the grave adele the world linked scorn with your other name love remembers but this ernest my grave is my revenge and your punishment a simple column broken at the top and bearing no name has these words 
the first at the trysting place another tomb has sculptured in marble on a marble cushion an exquisite hand holding a ring and the word without any name remember but why go on the imagination of a most imaginative people romance passion and sentiment have through fifty years inscribed their annals on the tombs of this cemetery we will leave them now when the cares the toils the vexations of this world sting and goad you when friends betray and the world that petty bustling self-satisfied hollow sordid world below palls on you come here to this city of the dead wander through its sunny streets so crowded yet so solitary then gentle softening feelings will steal over you and resigned consoled and hopeful you will go back content to suffer and to toil as those have toiled and suffered who now rest calmly here now the stream of sable-clad visitors is getting dense we cannot pass there is a mass of people kneeling and praying round this large mound where thousands undistinguished even by those who love them most now sleep this is the fosse commune the common grave the grave of those who having no possessions in the world had not wherewithal to buy a grave and were put here on the coffins of those whose lot had been like theirs and thus this great population moulder together nor child nor wife nor lover can mark where the loved one rests but they know that tis somewhere beneath this green waving grass and their tears flow fast see the lowly crowns not of roses and camellias but of common field flowers and holly piled upon this grave the pale autumn china rose the wallflower and the fragrant mignonette are here and there scattered flowers are cheap in paris all classes are fond of flowers and there is not an event in which they are not a commemoration from the christening to that baptism of tears the grave the crowd hushes its footsteps and the curious they are questioning here the low monotonous prayers for the dead even the falling of one bead of the rosary on another is heard distinctly sobs for the recent dead will sometimes rise in uncontrollable violence above all and the voices of the little children praying for their father's father with eyes upturned in awe and wonder to his which blinded with tears of manly grief are now upturned to heaven the rich on their way from their own dead kneel here in homage and often luxury will throw on this humble mound offerings of the choicest hothouse flowers such as bloom around it in its home well come now away i have taken you through the enchantments of paris it was but just that you should weep with those who have been gay and happy with you it was right that you should remember le jour des morts and now for our cabriolet a dash a whirl a allez donc once more we thread our own way through bustle life and animation we are going along the boulevards to the maison dorée in the gilded cité des italiens i am going to give you a dîner maigre fresh oysters opened at our table by the prettiest marchande in a picturesque opera comique costume with high cap long gold earrings striped petticoat handsome legs and wooden shoes shrimp soup the shrimps having disappeared into a rich gravy so don't look contemptuously then turbot au capre ah you've no turbot in america then filet de sol you've no soles either so you can't have this exquisite bit of fish with its pieces of crisp toast no bones and gravy à manger son père but you shall have some salsa fille à la barigoule sardines tunny fish côtelette de pommes de terre what potato cutlets why my good friend i cannot give you any other to-day le jour des morts is a fast day but we will end with some charlotte russe and a poule d'eau roasted but a poule means a fowl yes but a poule d'eau means a water-fowl and therefore not fowl but fish you look incredulous nonsense why did you never eat a squab owl in new york and know that it was not what it seemed and had not the game laws interfered would you not have called it a blank no matter what we have the canon laws before us and so we call our duck a poule d'eau 
and it is just as brown tender crisp and roasted to a turn as when called by its other name another glass of champagne champagne is not forbidden bishops drink it even on good friday then you shall melt a pear in your mouth taste some roast chestnuts nestled hot and golden in their snowy napkin a cup of mocha a glass of cognac and then what you will there is nothing impossible after such a dinner as a dîner maigre at the maison d'Ari. end of chapter ten chapter eleven of the ins and outs of paris or paris by day and night by julie de marguerite this librivox recording is in the public domain the louvre its kings courts and galleries the louvre how at this name the whole stirring times of the gorgeous romantic history of the middle ages of france rise up as one crosses its now silent courts leading the imposing procession comes francis i for whom pierre lescott first designed these walls giving to france the finest specimen of what has now almost become a recognized order of architecture like any other and which partly copied from italy was called the renaissance the great titian too is said to have given his advice and suggestions to both architect and king later came with catherine de medici and henry the second all the italian sculptors painters and architects then too diane de poitiers the woman so lavishly endowed by nature with beauty talent intellect taste all in fact but the one great gift without which all others are as not a womanly heart came with her counsels and directed the hand of the greatest sculptor france ever possessed jean goujon and in return for this patronage he has immortalized her in a statue as her namesake diana the chaste huntress and here as at fontainebleau are entwined in immortal arabesques the beloved cipher with the royal one of france then came francis the second and in these galleries the deep schemes of the guise the deadly hate of the huguenots and the catholics the jealousies of the perfidious catherine and the suspicions of the discontented nobles from the half-revolted provinces all grew and ripened whilst all these discordant elements were mixed in a continuous round of pleasure here too the lovely but unfortunate mary stuart passed the only happy period of her life her two years of royalty as queen of france the long galleries of the louvre with their floating plumes their soft music the diamond-hilted rapiers must have been the bright spot to which the poor queen looked back in her long years of exile and imprisonment then her pure first love for the young husband who leaving at twenty the throne of france died with the name of mary on his lips must have been the one oasis which that heart torn by contending passions remembered with holy reverence she seemed to feel the sad presentiment of her fate on leaving the shores of france which expresses itself in her plaintive farewell adieu plaisant pays de france ô oh, ma patrie la plus chérie qui a nourri ma jeune enfance adieu france adieu mes beaux jours next in the palace of the louvre appeared charles the ninth the modern orestes born with furies in his heart a type of the crimes and vices of a whole long long race what dark spectres waked him shuddering from the slumber you should have made so calm and so serene how pursued by some tormenting demon has this pale phantom of a king paced through the night these deserted and moonlit galleries under these windows flowed the blood of the huguenots on the terrible night of st bartholomew beneath these very windows was coligny the protestant hero born before the eyes of his perfidious king that window with the low iron balcony looking on the quay is the spot whence according to tradition charles fired upon his own people and it is no doubt pleasing to stand in the proud security of freedom and democracy under it and look defiance stop though this may indeed have been the spot but this is not the window for not only the window but this whole wing of the building was not built till many years after charles had been gathered to his ancestors the luxurious and effeminate henry the third followed with his minions and his little dogs still he has left posterity his contribution to the louvre that wing to the left as you stand looking towards the clock was the apartment of the great henri quatre 
than a poor but dreaded solicitor at the court of henry the third and there that strange compound of love and latin feminine caprice and manly courage of tender devotion and heartless debauchery marguerite de valois la reine margot kept her strange court where love was made in latin rendezvous in greek and the denouement in good french daggers and rapiers over the whole of this long line of royalty the spirit of catherine de medici seems to hover inspiring deeds of hatred perfidy and blood through the deep arches creeps the stealthy step of the astrologer and necroromancer confined for many months in one of those upper rooms gazing at the stars that presided at the birth of catherine as though the stars of heaven could direct such actions as catherine performed on earth but henry the fourth came at last he added one whole wing to the royal palace and begun what his son louis the thirteenth accomplished that long gallery which is what all foreigners come to see where the treasures of art of all nations and ages are collected and which has no rival but the pity palace at florence where stands the statue that enchants the world in the early part of the reign of louis the fourteenth anne of austria or rather mazarin with his italian tastes and instincts carried on the louvre con amore no less a personage than benini the architect of the circular porticoes of st peter's was sent for but after all the plans adopted in this portion of the palace were those of a physician claude perrault louis the fifteenth found the louvre ready-made to his hand he hated the clamorous noise and the dirt of paris and cared for neither art nor fame so the poor louvre one side of it was left without a roof till louis the sixteenth began to make plans and collect materials for finishing it which materials were taken stone after stone and brick after brick in the revolution and used by the people as missiles against the royal troops napoleon the great genius of activity carried the work of the louvre briskly on and in his gigantic plans intended that in the world no chef-d'oeuvre should be found anywhere but under its roof the galleries of the conquered continent were despoiled of all their best works and all was sent to paris but he fell before the louvre was finished the restored bourbons worked away at it and louis philippe did a good deal of frippery about it but it was left for napoleon the third to accomplish the work the pastime of so many dynasties and kings and ministers it now joins the palace of the tuileries and really may be said to be finished the jeering proverb applied to all thoroughly hopeless and impossible enterprises quand le louvre sera fini may be now said to have lost its meaning let us pause before we leave this inner court observe that the work of so many hands of so many generations is complete harmonious as though it had sprung all finished from one magic touch the true love of art has presided here no desire for individual distinction no joining of various tastes in various styles no individualities have been attempted by each succeeding artist the original idea of the original architects has been carried out and the exquisite keeping the proportion creates that calm solemnity of grandeur which is the distinctive feature of harmonious beauty the courts of the louvre are not much frequented you can hear the measured tread of the sentinels at each gate and between four and five o'clock in the afternoon groups of men whose white neckcloths and rusty black clothes indicate them to be lawyers barristers and magistrates hurry across with bundles of papers under their arms from the palais de justice on the old ile st louis to their various abodes by this gate you will catch a glimpse of one of the finest specimens of old saxon gothic architecture in paris the church of st germain l'auxerrois it was considerably damaged by the revolutionists of july but has been repaired with great regard to the original style of architecture showing the characteristic good taste of the french this is the parish church of the palace of the tuileries but the last church-going queen marie amelie preferred the modern magnificence of saint roch and the courtier-like eloquence of its curé olivier the present bishop of evreux to the grey solemnity of these old walls without the gates of the louvre the victims of july lay for some time buried with pompous inscriptions but they were afterwards removed into the heart of the popular quartier whence probably they came and now rest under the column of july in the place de la bastille 
one more historical remembrance and then let us enter this famous gallery which all these kings and emperors have been building for us turn round to the right towards the quay there is a little garden enclosed within the gilded railing to this day it is called le jardin de l'infante the garden of the infanta though she who gave it that name is dead and crumbled into dust two centuries ago i doubt whether of the many thousands who pass it during the day there is one who knows the cause of its bearing the name it does here then two centuries ago was brought a young spanish princess who was selected by the cabinets of france and spain for the wife of louis the fifteenth she was a fair young creature a mere child and this garden was made for the sports of herself and her boy lover she lived here for some years until she grew to womanhood and louis became one of the most accomplished princes of his day but then just as the marriage was about to be solemnized politics suddenly changed and the infanta torn from her young lover was conducted solemnly back to spain louis the fifteenth probably never thought of her again but clara eugenia like a true spaniard turned from love to devotion and ended her broken-hearted life in a stern spanish convent it is said that a little drawing of this garden of the louvre hung constantly in her cell strange that time revolt and invasion which have destroyed so many marble palaces and raised fortresses to their very foundations should have spared this little spot of earth where the trees under which the infanta sported have grown into sturdy old oaks and where shrubs the offspring of the first planted have mingled in one tangled mass this memorial of the one pure passion of a corrupt age and a perverted king bears still the name love gave it and exists now as it did two centuries ago in all the simplicity of nature and now for the pictures for which tired perhaps of my dull lesson in history or careless about persons and events that can have no claims upon your democratic sympathies you have been impatiently waiting but i am not going to take you to the regular picture gallery tour and tell you of all the raphaels the titians the giorgionis or the lesseurs joseph vernes and david's the riberas murillos and velasquezes about which the connoisseurs of various countries are continually wrangling a picture gallery is a picture gallery whether it be at paris florence dresden or munich so far as concerns the pictures you will choose your school according to your taste of course you will pause at the belle ferronniere of titian marvelling at the artist and wondering at the taste of the king for those cold straight features scarcely seem to warrant the absorbing passion his last of the witty chivalric francis i then too those deep magic eyes that long wavy hair brown in the shade and golden in the sun of the jaconda whoever she may have been whom giorgione has chained to the canvas breathing through centuries the reality of passion and intellect you cannot choose but pause and do reverent homage to her the pictures here are all of times and all countries but the true parisian features are to be noticed in everything around observe as you enter the polite swiss in the imperial livery of green and gold which has succeeded the scarlet and white of the two bourbons he almost apologizes for fulfilling the formality of looking at your passport he doesn't think it a bore to rise from his seat with a frenchman's national vanity he fancies at that moment that he represents la grande nation and is proud of doing the honours of the louvre to an englishman ah mais monsieur is an american an extra bow and a very hard look at your white skin ah monsieur vient de loin ah monsieur is from the glorious country of washington that monsieur may admire notre musée and he waves you up that grand imposing double staircase which seems large and wide enough to admit of a friendly meeting of the two nations on the landing how this magnificent staircase prepares you for the majestic far-extending gorgeous yet grand simplicity of the finest gallery in the world the arched ceiling so beautifully carved and gilded the pink marble entablature beneath the pictures the marble columns which here and there break the monotony of this long extent the polished oaken floor is so bright that it reflects as in some dark lake the objects above and around it the proportions the harmony of the whole 
proclaim a monument created by generations of kings and immortal artists here again are our polite friends in the green and gold they civilly answer any question and show you any particular picture as you lean on the brass railing which separates you from the paintings these liveried guardians will most delicately insinuate the rules of the place one being against desecrating the polished floor with the juice of that weed for discovering which sir walter raleigh richly deserved the fate he got for some far less heinous offence they will tell you various anecdotes and of various proposed improvements but they will take nothing from you indeed as you may notice you get all your sights for nothing and as a foreigner you are privileged to come whenever you like we french must have a special permission or a public day of which there are many or a sunday to come to our own glorious gallery well we have no time for the pictures who would look at an inanimate canvas when there are pretty faces beaming with intelligence and life with large bright eyes looking up so becomingly and delicate white hands tracing so beautifully and so patiently the masterpieces on the walls paris is the paradise of women says the proverb but if it is and we do not deny it a woman's paradise does not consist in idleness for in no other country does woman find so much occupation or share in so many of the toils of life which produce independence now one of the favourite resources of the industrious is the art of drawing and painting girls are regularly educated for artists in france they have a happy knack or custom of learning to draw before they begin to paint unlike some countries where the brush comes first and the pencil never comes after and there are many distinguished painters among these female artists the patronage which the catholic church extends to the arts ensures full occupation to all who are capable for from the highest metropolitan cathedral to the humblest village chapel copies of the great pictures of saints and scriptural subjects are continually being ordered see how many of these fair artists are here particularly before the panels of the italian school young more of them under than over twenty so neatly dressed not a stain on the white manchette or the simple muslin dress so grave so silent so intent no gossiping or giggling so absorbed that they never turn from their work to idle after visitors these girls belong by their education to the higher middle classes of life they are daughters of government employés with small salaries of professional men often of artists for talent is frequently hereditary their ability does not frighten away suitors and as a wife the young artist will probably continue to minister to the comforts of her home if not to its necessities there is nothing masculine in any of these women who have not scorned to make use of those intellectual faculties which heaven has distributed in equal proportions to the male and the female they are modest graceful cheerful nay very women fond of dress and amusement quite as much so as their sisters of other countries who think it their first duty to be utterly useless to themselves and everybody else in every parisian counting-house the wife or daughter keeps the books and conducts the correspondence in the old mercantile houses such as those of the rue de la verrerie the quai voltaire has almost as many female as male engravers on steel and wood all the circulating libraries are kept by women and most of the country post offices the great booksellers and publishers have some female member of their own family who courteous and willing will give you the intelligent information you may require as to any rare edition of old or new works such as no surly ignorant clerk would condescend to do the great printing establishment which prints the journal des débats belonged to and was under the personal superintendence of a woman madame lenormand woman in france is the helpmate the companion the friend as well as the wife and though it is the fashion to laugh at french domestic habits there is no country in the world where there are fewer unhappy marriages or where family ties are so much cherished and revered some of these young girls over whose easels you are now bending will perhaps marry artists it is more than probable for i see many of those bearded and moustached copyists looking by the by like models for their own pictures gazing very intently towards that young creature with her clear blue eyes her white forehead with the brown hair so tastily brushed up from it revealing the small pink ear and the blue veins of the temple well then 
they will have the happiest of earthly lots mutual love and congeniality of taste together with a thorough appreciation of each other's susceptibility and a complete understanding of all the hardships and difficulties of the career before them for which they both have sympathy and consolation but to return to our louvre over these old pictures when the time comes for the annual modern exhibition the pictures by the living artists will be placed so that for some three months the immortal works will be hidden to all by the contemporary candidates for immortality beneath us are the sculpture galleries the best works here are modern there was a time when the glories of ancient art were all assembled here in the days of the first napoleon but on his downfall the allies took each their own back again here was brought the belvidere apollo and here at the foot of the godlike statue stood bewildered and transfixed by its beauty the young daughter of one of the modern masters of french art the baron gros day after day she would come before this realization of her dreams and placing wreaths of fresh flowers on the pedestal sit for hours gazing on her idol until perhaps she fondly hoped some spark from her own burning bosom would endow the cold marble with love and life paler day by day grew her cheek and slighter the slight form that crushed at the feet of the inexorable unmoved majestic god until one day they found her with her head buried in her hands leaning against the pedestal cold pale and dead as the lover she adored was this madness it was called poetry romance at that time and poets have made this love their theme but some years later when the father full of honours wealth and power beloved and happy so said the world sprang into the waters of the seine they said as they laid him by his child that both the father and daughter had been mad who shall judge the father has left pictures which reveal endowments the excess of which might lead to madness whilst his child has left but a vague tradition of hopeless love to which even now her name is scarcely ever affixed the solemn grandeur of these walls the white immovability of these ghost-like statues the cold atmosphere which pervades this sculpture gallery an atmosphere peculiar to such places i know not why have made one quite melancholy and gloomy hark the guard of the tuileries is beating to arms let us go and see the representative into which the imperial dynasty has now firmly passed he is coming from the tuileries and after reviewing the last regiment of the new reinforcements for the crimea he is going accompanied by his empress to view the gigantic building and street improvements which he is carrying on in the heart of the city and especially to inspect the progress of a new model mechanics lodging-house erected according to his own plans and under his own immediate supervision this is a utilitarian age the valois and the bourbons built the palace and the galleries of the louvre the bonapartes build houses and workshops well one louvre is enough for the world but there are not half enough of houses and workshops End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the ins and outs of paris or Paris by Day and Night by Julie de Marguerite. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sister of Charity, the Dame de Charité, and the Enfant Trouvé. Did you ever take Paris in its serious point of view? No, never. I see it by your wondering look. You have thought of Paris only under two aspects one as the emporium of fashion, fun, and refinement the abode of good fellows somewhat dissipated of fascinating ladies somewhat over-kind of succulent dinners somewhat indigestible of pleasures somewhat illicit the others as a place par excellence of revolutions barricades fightings and emeutes but these are mere thunderclouds the serious part of the population those who take life in earnest those who live for others those who exist for the consolation of humanity to reform its vices to minister to its ills and sorrows these you have never thought of i will not take you to the hospitals of paris your guide-book will tell you all about these and will also show you that there the first physicians tend the sick and that the best of nurses watch them 
but i will take you to the one of the holiest institutions that catholicism has inspired the most appropriate to woman's nature the most useful in all its appliances i will take you to the establishment of the sisters of charity do not expect a convent with its monastic solemnities its traditional tourrière with her large keys its majestic abbess and its pealing organs where we are going is simply a shabby-looking house in the small dirty street leading from the rue st honore to the boulevards and from its vicinity to the church of that name called the rue st roch knock and enter you tread on a sanded floor horsehair chairs and sofas are around at a table piled with papers sits an aged woman in the garb of the sisters of st vincent paul all black except a cape of white linen and a headdress of the same material somewhat like a sunbonnet but protruding further over the face now we are here what shall we say the superior looks up and waits ma soeur we are foreigners and we come but to look through the establishment of les soeurs de charité of whom we have heard so much there is no establishment we have no pictures no sculptured altars we cannot tarry to kneel on tessellated pavements before images of saints or martyrs our place is for ever among the sick and the suffering with the dying outcast with the wailing and abandoned infant but you behold us here this house is known to belong to the sisters of charity here i the secretary am ever ready to receive all visitors and in an adjoining room are sisters waiting to fulfil the mission of charity at the first summons of my bell to all without distinction of nation creed or rank are our services given the poor and friendless or the rich whose selfishness has made a solitude around them even to the degraded dying of disease and vice to the resigned christian to the raving blasphemer to each to all do our sisters come and with tenderness care and patience tend and heal the weary and suffering bodies and often calm and bring to god the desolate and despairing ah women in your country they tell me monsieur l'américain have claimed women's rights but ours is the sweetest noblest right of all it makes us equal to angels angels not such as poets and admirers call us but god's angels like those who ministered to christ you smile to hear me speak of poetry and admiration you wonder that in this solemn garb i should know anything of the world but we are of the world our ranks are recruited from the highest as well as the lowest ranks of society our vows are not perpetual until after a long and practical novitiate of many years five years is the usual term and then without the slightest blame or a remark of any kind a woman can if she chooses return to her family and to social life it is neither despair nor bigotry nor tyranny which gives us nuns of the order of st vincent de paul but it is a vocation for charitable deeds a tender pity for the ills of life a desire to be of use to our fellow-creatures i who now speak to you am a widow i am well off i have children and grandchildren married and prosperous i see them every day my presence does not check the mirth of their guests though it may hollow the conversation nor does my sombre black dress repress the lisping caresses of my grandchildren i have done my duty towards them all they have their inheritance they will have mine but rather than spend my income and my time in frivolities ill becoming an old woman i give both to the great family of the poor and needy now i must show you the flower of our flock and she tinkled a silver bell the door of an inner room opened and there clad in the same garb as herself a tall graceful girl of about eighteen to describe the holy sweetness of the expression pervading a face faultless as to feature dazzling as to complexion would be impossible its apparition was like some pure and holy thought of our childish memories evoked in an hour of worldly toil and tribulation the vision with its earnest eyes looked straight at us and smiled the salutation so easy so elegant was such as is taught in courts we scarcely dared to speak sister rosalie said the old lady these visitors are from a far-off land bien oui, 
bien loin au delà des mers from america and they have brought a tribute of charity for the one of your charges who needs it most the vision smiled again so soft a smile yet beaming from the brightening eye and mantling in the flushing cheek it thanked us in words though we listened but to the gentle voice and it was not till she who had first received us repeated it the second time that we understood that our gold piece was rejected and that five francs was all that would be accepted then from the long wide sleeves a fair soft hand was withdrawn and in its rosy palm we placed with reverence our offering another slow and graceful obeisance a frank merci a smile which included all and the vision vanished that said our hostess is the daughter of the duchess de the only daughter beloved admired happy she has been here four years one more and she will return to her proper station young as she looks for tis not toil but evil passions that wrinkle the brow pure thoughts prolong our youth she will then be five-and-twenty and in a few months afterwards she will bear the name and the title of a husband as noble as herself there was no peculiar circumstance or event which induced her determination of coming to us it was the result of a comparison of the wretched lot of so many with her own favoured and happy fate she felt as though god would exact for so many good gifts something more than the mere giving of alms and she came amongst us a saint in conduct a child in thought a woman in tenderness and long-suffering her fiance who is her cousin and known by her from infancy as he passes in his carriage often sees her wading through the rain but she turns on him her sweet smile of love and hope and he feels she is protected by a higher power here we felt it right that our visit should end we had already occupied too much of the invaluable time of the good sister examples such as this we had just heard related are not rare either in the higher or in the middle classes the women of france of all ranks are actively benevolent does distress or sickness come upon you go to one of these houses of the sisters of charity and at whatever hour of the day or night one of the sisters will obey your summons if you are rich she will not ask or even seek to know why you are alone and have no help but from public charity and pity if you are poor she will bring such succour as the funds of their special branch afford then if the case is beyond her means she will have recourse to the assistance of a dame de charité now a dame de charité is a lady of high position each section has a certain number marie amelie wife of louis philippe was a dame de charité though of course her functions were filled by deputy these dames de charité give amply from their own purses they are the bankers of the sisters of charity and when their own means are exhausted they step into their carriages and with a large velvet bag go round to every house within their district begging succour for the poor and suffering their high names their elegant toilettes their winning manners their splendid equipages are all adjuncts in the cause of charity and the poor cease to envy when they see the use to which apparent extravagance and folly are put behold too the sister of charity at the cradle of infancy by the deserted pillow over which no mother ever bends within the walls of the enfant trouvé there in two rows on either side of a long dormitory enveloped in clean swaddling clothes lie more than a hundred infants sleeping or wailing their first hours in a world which has reserved no place for them beneath a father's roof a large numbered card on the breast of each is all that distinguishes them one from another all the parentage they can ever claim but how unwearingly from bed to bed feeding with sweetened milk or soothing to soft slumber goes the gentle sister of charity none will ever claim this child its own mother who scarcely looked at it on its birth would not know it among so many but to the sister of charity it is a well-beloved child a soul from god and she tends it as though it were the offspring of the tenderest love that ever bent over the cradle of a first-born rousseau harsh and morose might well send his children to the enfant trouvé away from the drunken brutality of such a mother as therese these children unclaimed and unmarked may have gone forth to the world able and useful members of society 
or perhaps some gentle sister's kiss has caught their last sigh in the early days of their infancy what was the inheritance their father could have left them a name linked with high genius but a fame obscured by petty vices envy hatred and discontent End of chapter 12